to think about Stephen Nolan, the, the, the first thing we have to, to keep in mind is that the last decade has experienced an incredible growth in the importance of environmental, social, and good governance criteria. Uh, all this in, in, in investment decision, right? what maybe we could call sustainable finance if we want to put it in one, in one word. Uh, Dublin has played a significant role in this progress, and I think uh, in good part thanks to, to the speaker today, hmm? to, Stephen, to Stephen Nolan. So Stephen Nolan started in IT, and what he told me kind of uh, by by coincidence, mm, uh, in the in the education in 2003, in 2003, where he was the CEO of the Global e School and Communities Initiative, a UN founded organization to advise ministers of education in developing world to make good strategic decisions in incorporating uh, IT uh, uh, IT in in their uh, in their curricula. Uh, but it's prior to 2010 when he focuses, or he returns to, to financing and becomes the CEO and co-founder of the Green International Financial Services Center that makes Ireland the leader in, in green financing. So I'm not going to list uh, all the positions and achievements of Stephen because I'm not giving the talk today, uh, but let me just highlight a couple of them. So he has also worked as the advisor for the Paladin Capital Group Europe, and an initiative that it's quite interesting, that uh, or at least I find quite interesting, that it's the 40 under 40 hmm, uh, sustainable business leaderships, which are 40 company executives under 40 leading Ireland's corporate sustainability behavior. Uh, his activity hmm, has nothing but increased in the last year. He, since 2007, has been a member of the steering committee of the Sustainable and Responsible Investment uh, Forum in Ireland. And in 2019, has been appointed as the Managing Director of the UN Environmental Financial Center of Sustainability Network. So with these credentials, I think we can expect a very exciting and educating talk tonight. And without further ado, huh? thanks, Stephen, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I feel like I, I need to bring you back to Ireland with me. Um, it'd be great to say that to an Irish audience. Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for having me here in Barcelona today and tomorrow. I'm here today to work with the guys on the event and also tomorrow to work with the Barcelona Financial Services Center to launch Barcelona Sustainable Finance Initiative. So I'm really excited to be here for two days. I want to thank Tony uh, and obviously BBVA for hosting us here today. Uh, there's a reason why Spain is a leader in sustainable finance, and it's down to individuals like Tony and the financial institutions that they work for in green bonds and the whole area of responsible investment. I want to thank the foundation for having me here as well. Uh, I was Gina was explained to me the good work that you do. It's quite it's quite amazing, actually, quite inspiring. So thank you very much for for organising today. And then obviously, none of this would happen without Gina uh, from ReCity and her colleagues. So again, thank you, Gina. She gave me a bit of a start a few weeks ago. When I rang her, I said, what do you need me to do, Gina? And she goes, well, a TED Talk. And I'm like, a TED Talk? I said, have you seen a TED Talk? And so she got me quite nervous. And the sweat on my forehead, which is always quite shiny over the phone, I was like, are you sure it's a TED Talk? But uh, I'm glad that it's not. Uh, and then I asked the guys today, what do you need me to do? And they said, just be entertaining. So, you know, these, I'm not Tony, I'm not you guys. And so I'm not going to be entertaining. I'm going to focus on the facts. Uh, but I am genuinely thrilled to be here with you. I think Ireland and Spain share uh, a lot of characteristics um, and we travel across each other's path quite a, quite a lot. So as I said, Tony, thank you for hosting us. Thank you to Foundation for, for supporting the good work of ReCity and Gina, thank you for facilitating and bringing us all together. So my presentation has basically been, Tony's given away all the secrets. Uh, so I'm gonna dash through it and I'm open for, for questions, but we're, who am I today? As, as, as I was just, I'm an ex-Irish government advisor on technology. I was co-finance advisor on technology and education. I then worked for a number of high net worth individuals and in strategy as their chiefs of staff. And then a number of years ago, at the height of the Irish crisis, uh, when Ireland was really going down the tubes, and the IMF were in going, you have to do this, you have to do that, we were looking at our international financial services centre and saying, what can we actually do with Ireland's international centre? 
Ireland, believe it or not, is the largest uh, area for the uh, leasing of aviation aircraft. 60% of aircraft leasing is done through Ireland. And that actually came about through the founder of Ryanair. He started a business, it was about uh, leasing planes. It failed, and the guys used to work from went and set up their own businesses and created a cluster effect. And that's part of the reason why I'm talking about today. And then he went off and set up Ryanair, so he didn't do bad in the end himself. But Ireland also has 35,000 bonds listed on the, on the stock exchange, and there's over 4 trillion euros in funds uh, administered and serviced out of Ireland. So there's over 40,000 people in our small country work in international financial services sector. And then obviously as a domestic economy, uh, we are now the fast and growest growing economy in Europe. It looks like that may be knocked off kilter by Brexit. We'll see what happens there, but I won't mention the B word again. Uh, tonight. Uh, as the closest neighbour, we, we focus in on a lot of it, and I suppose if it does happen, Ireland will lose a lot of GDP points, uh, which would be a bit of a, obviously a problem. But what I am here today to talk about is more about the, the European network around um, ESG, or sustainable finance, and I'm thrilled to be able to do that as an Irish person. Uh, Ireland and Irish people are very outward looking. We are a very open economy, I think second in the world after Singapore, so we travel well, and you'll always find a paddy somewhere. If not a paddy, you'll always find a paddy's pub somewhere in the world, and I saw a few in Barcelona when I walked around today. So again, thank you for having me here. I'm going to talk about the UN Environment Convened Network of Financial Centres for Sustainability. But before I jump into it, and again, as Tony said, the five drivers, but, but what is sustainable finance? Uh, that's a key one. Uh, and, you know, sustainable finance is any form of financial service that integrates environmental, social and governance criteria into the business or investment decisions for the lasting benefit of both clients and society at large. And that's the key difference. So what, so ESG, environment, social and governance, what was 20, 25, even 15 years ago, Tony, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, mm -hmm. very much a niche space is now becoming more and more mainstream. And from my perspective, we hear terms such as green finance, climate finance, sustainable finance. I'm in this space and I get confused with all the different terms. I think over the next number of years, it will just be finance. It will be about commerce because as Tony pointed out, this is through the perspective of long-termism. And that's what we're looking at. And eventually you won't see firms reporting on a quarterly basis, it'll be on the medium to long term. So as I said, for the lasting benefit of both clients and society at large, um, then what is a sustainable finance financial centre? And that is a centre that contributes to sustainable development and value creation in economic, environmental and social terms. So what we're seeing tomorrow evening in the stock exchange here in Barcelona is that Barcelona is set launching its own sustainable finance initiative. So Tony and his colleagues and Santander and other institutions, including the Stock Exchange, are coming together to mobilize the Barcelona community and the Barcelona community uh, cluster, an ecosystem of financial service players, to say, what is Barcelona going to do in this space? And Barcelona is obviously an international financial services center as well, uh, and your footprint is global, but also in the region. Because here, in this area, you have to decarbonize your economy over the coming decades. Where is that money going to come from? And why shouldn't it be Spanish capital uh, supported by government to invest in those technologies? And therefore, why then can't it be Spanish technology that is then exported around the world to decarbonize the rest of the world? So that's what sustainable finance is. Uh, that's what a sustainable finance center uh, is. And what we have here today now is we've got, under the UN, 22 financial centers have come together to create this network, and Barcelona is one of those, I'm very pleased to say. So again, I think as Tony said, just if you, if you don't mind me just recapping this, otherwise I'll lose my way. A global shift is underway, uh, and no, increased number of leading financial centers have taken strategic action on sustainable finance. So you would have seen first Paris, and then London. London as a global financial centre is no surprise. Paris obviously out of COP21, the Paris Agreement. And what was different that I saw in the Paris discussions versus my previous work in the UN, in the previous years when I was about technology and development, it was the heads of corporate social responsibility that came to the meetings. And they had a, they had a budget, and it was more around CSR. Now what you actually have coming to these meetings are the equivalents of Tony's, that are in business development. 
and that's a different type of animal within an institution. It's strategic, it's looking at the institution from a risk and a reward perspective going forward. In 2017, uh, the UN established the FC4S network at the request of the G7, which is great, and then in this year, the network is driving collaborative projects, engaging new members, and advising on strategies. So in the last year alone, we've jumped from 11 members to 22, and I hope to increase that growth over the next months. Uh, we've just launched a new report, a number of weeks ago with the Commission in Brussels and effectively what we did there we actually analyzed all the centers to see what they're doing and we were the first uh, body to do that and we were able to do that because of the UN so don't forget all these centers are also competing and I think coming together under a UN umbrella allows everybody to say how we can we collaborate rather than compete and therefore information is willing to be shared in Europe we facilitate policy engagement with the European Commission and strategic projects between European centres. And I think one of the things that Tony said, and he chairs the European Banking Federation uh, Working Group on Sustainable Finance, there is so much happening in Brussels on this topic right now. And as Tony mentioned, one of the drivers is regulators. It's not DG Climate or DG Environment, it's DG FISMA, which is the Financial Services Regulator. So that means that the entire capital markets ecosystem is watching this and saying, well, what are you going to actually uh, suggest? So there's a whole thing about taxonomy, green bonds, so on and so forth. So the real kicker, as Tony mentioned, is the regulatory pressure is a big one as well. And the fact that the commission is saying, we want to be a leader in this space. And you know, it wasn't that long ago, if you remember, when we used to have Nokia's and Ericsson phones at a global level, Europe was the leader. Now we're using an Apple phone. Again, what Europe is looking at is, why can't we be leader in sustainable finance within Europe, but also globally? And why can't it be European capital, knowledge, tech in, in the future that kind of decarbonizes the world? So, as I said, we aim to really accelerate growth in sustainable finance markets in 2019. We have a special focus on Africa, which I'll come to in a moment. So the context, again, the role of financial centers for sustainable development, 70 trillion, 70 trillion of assets under management of companies which are signatories to the UN principles for responsible investment. So over 2,000 signatories. And what that is, is a company, as Tony said, it's from the investment world, that as a, if I'm looking to invest in you and you want to, ma sorry, if I'm looking for you to manage my money, I want to know that you signed up to these principles around that environmental, social and governance. And right now, if you haven't signed up, there's a big question mark around you. And that's why over 2,000 have signed up. $140 billion total insured losses from natural disasters in 2017. And I think what we're now seeing, what were one in 1,000 year events are now becoming every few years are happening at scale and costing a lot of money. And actually what's interesting about that 140 billion was another 140 or so billion was uninsured of losses. So in total it was nearly 300 billion of losses in, in that year alone. 14 times increase in annual issuance of labelled green bonds from 11 to 155 billion. And here in Barcelona, there's a lot of activity going on in green bonds as well. And this is a real kicker that myself and Tony were talking to a journalist about earlier on today. When you know something's of interest, policymakers are looking at it. You know, since 2013, over 270 policies in the area of sustainable finance from different governments in the world have issued from China to India to Europe. And so there's a lot happening in this space. That's given a policy anchor to entrepreneurs, which is then allowing them to go to capital markets seeking capital. So why focus on financial centers? There's an estimated 100 plus major financial centers around the world, <coughs> a key community to accelerate finance for sustainable de development and climate action. So again, go all the way back to the Paris Agreement and the UN Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. It is estimated by the G20 that $90 trillion is required to, uh, to be mobilized in support of climate action. That's $90 trillion. If you make it down to a very small country like Ireland, Ireland between now and 2030 needs to mobilize 50 billion euro. So, you know, I don't know what Spain is, I don't know what this region is, but it's in the billions, if not the hundreds of billions here in Spain, given that Ireland, like a small country, is, 100, is 50 billion. So this is about capital. It's not about corporate social responsibility. It's not about philanthropy. It's about capital being mobilized to get a decent return, and that will be paid back and has a positive effect. So why financial centers? It's harnessing the cluster effect. So the synergies and concentration of activities, say in Barcelona, banking, capital markets, the stock exchange, insurance, prof professional services, public finance and regulation. It's driving competitiveness, as Tony said, the drivers. Sustainability has become a key factor when somebody is looking at you as a centre and saying, are you taking this seriously uh, in terms of upside opportunities and downside risk? One of the reasons for that, if you step back for a moment and you look at a police or a teacher, or a policeman or a teacher, so a policeman will go out in the beat for 30 years and he or she will retire tomorrow. They'll have been putting into their pension fund for the last 30 years. They expect, as long as they live, to actually get a pension check each month. The cop that then appears 
to take over from him or her will work for another 30 years. So institutional investors are looking at this as a 60-year cycle, and so they want to know where they invest their money is going to be managed in a way which is sustainable. Delivering policy goals, I mentioned the Commissioner earlier on, I won't go over that. And then this is the really interesting one, and again, it's sometimes what we forget. Uh, what are the financial sector? Well, what is the capital market for? It's to service the real economy. It's to create jobs, to support jobs, and it's that word commerce. It's to support commerce. And I suppose that's one of the key areas that we're focused on. It offers a way for financial centres to serve the real economy in transition, closing the gap between Wall Street and Main Street. The different dimensions of a sustainable finance centre, so banking, debt capital, insurance, investment, nothing that you wouldn't be aware of there, but all these different areas that you may touch upon, either as a retail, in a bank such as this, or in a stock exchange, are all now trying to figure out how do they embrace sustainable finance, as Tony said, from a risk or an opportunity perspective, that people are struggling. As I said, different languages, uh, different definitions. But as Tony said earlier on, if you're not in this space, you're going to be left behind. And as an institution, you will fail eventually, because this is now what is being demanded. And those five dri drivers, the global agenda, the market, the investment, pressure from regulators, and then tech, this is impacting all this uh, agenda here and this ecosystem in, in, in particular as it relates to climate action. Growing momentum. Uh, in the last three years, as I said, there's been over 270 new policies. Imagine what the next three years are going to look like. This is getting faster and faster and faster. More deals are being found. Regulators coming into the marketplace and saying, we don't actually have that long anymore. And I'm not saying this from somebody is from a climate perspective I'm looking at this from a you know with two with a young family myself we're looking at the 2030 now and saying we actually only have really 12 years to figure this out and so we need to unlock 90 trillion over the next decade how can you do that in a way which is sane which is reasonable which is not going to lead to massive losses so what you're seeing as Tony said earlier on a lot has happened at the policy level to create an anchor for the capital markets and the entrepreneurs to play in and to be successful so as Tony said earlier on, 2015, you had COP, you had the UN SDGs, G20 in China, 2016, European Union kicking off 2017, Mayor Bloomberg coming in in 2017 with Governor Carney, G7 Italy, and then obviously the launch of our network. So it, this thing is really like a snowball uh, gaining a lot of traction. G7 have endorsed what we do, which is fantastic. It's a beautiful table there with loads of grass on it. Uh, but as they said, sustainable finance is fundamental to achieve sustainability and climate goals. We recognise the commitments made by financial sectors and centres and the potential. So effectively what the ministers for the environment here were saying is governments do not have enough money to meet that 90 trillion. They need to crowd in private capital. Private capital, such as Tony's institution, will only get involved if there are sound and solid policy environments in place to allow them to invest along industry. If not, that's CSR, that's philanthropy, or that will see a financial system in meltdown. And as Tony mentioned, Governor Carney earlier on, you know, this is a big risk to the financial services sector climate. And he said, if we do not deal with this as regulators, what happened in 2008 and 2009 in Spain and Ireland, other jurisdictions, will just be a small little pebble in the ocean in comparison to what could potentially happen. So this is, this is the, the, the governor of the Bank of England saying that. About uh, the FC Fres network, and I'll push through this quickly, it's a partnership between leading financial centres the UN with a secretariat headquarters in Geneva. Its objective, enable financial uh, centres to exchange experience, drive convergence and take action and share priorities to accelerate the expansion of green and system of finance. In effect, to come together around a table and say, outside this room we compete, inside this room we need to mobilise this, we need to mobilise our ecosystems behind us, what can you do, what can I do, London, Frankfurt, Dublin, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Shanghai, wherever it may be, how can we work together to mobilise our centres and support this agenda, and in doing so do it in the right way. There's 22 members, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, coverage is across Europe, Asia, Africa and the Americans, and what we have, and we're very fortunate that we're funded by governments in the main, uh, and a foundation, and a limited amount of private sector capital. Here's the membership, there's Barcelona third from the top, and as you said, fantastic tomorrow to be formally launching the Barcelona Sustainable Finance Initiative. From a personal perspective, Ankel, who is the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the MD of the Barcelona Centre here, only reached out to us last September. I was in Barcelona a month later, speaking to 100 people in the stock exchange. He came to Dublin for a UN event a month later. Uh, he was then at another event with us in January, I believe, and then we're back here in April. So in the space of eight months, where Barcelona was, what are we doing 
the strategic scope and the strategic vision that's gone into saying we now know what we want to do, which is going to be launched tomorrow, which is quite exciting. And it kind of gives a sense of what the centre is trying to do. Casablanca, uh, that's where our first meeting was. It sounds very romantic. It wasn't. My flights were both delayed. I got in really, really late, and I saw the inside of a hotel room in a conference centre, and I didn't see a piano. But it was a fantastic space to be at with 11 or 12 different centres all saying, hey, how can we work together, which really kicked it off in September 2017. Obviously, Dublin's there, but then you've got locations like <coughs> Hong Kong, uh, London, uh, Liechtenstein, Nairobi is one of our latest members to come on board. Again, a lot of money required in Africa, but deemed by capital markets to be quite risky, Tony, if that would be the, the perception. And so one of the things that FC for us is going to work with in the capital market uh, sector in, Europe, in Africa is to upskill at a technical level and capacity. Paris, New York, Mayor Bloomberg helped create the US Alliance for Sustainable Finance. We're thrilled with that. And he came on board before Christmas. Uh, Seoul, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Toronto's there as well. Interesting about China, uh, you've got Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong, hopefully a few more cities in China. The scale of China. I was in Shanghai recently and it just blew me away, the scale, and how bright everything was in the evening time. But it, it was amazing, the, we have to do this. And it obviously is from an opportunity perspective. They reckon that every new vehicle that's gonna be built in China in the next three to five years will be an electric vehicle. That's it, that's where they're going. There won't be any, uh, of the other type, and they're doing it because they have to do it. Uh, they have to do it from an economic development perspective, from a societal development perspective. We know, I think London alone, 15,000 people die a year from smog. So imagine what it is in some of the bigger cities in, in China. So they're doing this from perspective of we want to invest and do the right thing from an economic perspective, but also from a societal perspective as well. Uh, our network, you know, key goals, obviously the secretary, which I head up, outputs and deliverables. I'll talk about this in a moment. Our assessment too, but this has given us great data that others don't have to work with our partners to advise them on how best and where they should go. And then obviously at, an, at, a, at a regional level, we have an FC for us Europe uh, based out of Dublin. We have an FC for us Asia out of Shanghai. We are building FC for us Africa. And in the Americas, we're now looking at Latin America and North America, and we'll see what may happen there over the coming months. Uh, if I may just uh, on this, one of the things we do, we helped, I suppose Barcelona was a case in point of this, is we go into centres and we say, well, where are you right now? So I know Paris is quite far along, I know London is, but where was Barcelona last September? And I think Tony, be fair, Ankel and others are saying, well, where are we actually? Can we have a bit of, a bit of help? Uh, and so we were able to assess the position of Barcelona, uh, work with the guys, or the guys then, once they knew that, to set priorities themselves uh, with the President Luis, build capacity up within the centre, and then actually not just build capacity, we go, hang on, we have got experts here in the sector but maybe we're not talking to them and we need to connect them. And I know, Tony, you're, you're based here in your institution, but there are, are, there are, are others. Catalyze action, and that's what's actually the result of what we've done the last few months is tomorrow, that Barcelona is now gonna launch its own initiative in this space. And then share best practice, so Barcelona, and Ankel has come to a lot of different sessions and said to me, can we have a coffee? How did you do this in Dublin? And he wasn't asking me how did it go right, it was, where did it go wrong? And it was very interesting, and then asking other partners, what did you do right? And so suddenly within that network, he was able to get access to a lot of knowledge and then obviously review and refine. The right-hand side, the level zero to level five, is how I measure. So level five is achieving complete alignment with the uh, Paris Agreement and the UN SDGs. Nobody's there at this point. Level zero is ground, level zero is ground zero. And so there's obviously centers that are there. Level one is awareness, two is evolving, three is getting strategic and four is going mainstream. So most centers, including Barcelona, are in between evolving and getting strategic. And that's where most people are right now. So my goal and the goal of the FC for s is to assist with the resources we have and to accelerate that transition from level three or level two up to the next next level. Um, I'll skip on that. Shifting gears is a report we did here. This is uh, how the world's leading financial centers are entering a new phase of strategic action on green and sustainable finance. Some of the key findings, again, um, blah, 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 I'll just keep going through this. So. Here you are, 10 key insights on how financial centres are mobilising expertise and capital to help solve some of the world's toughest challenges. So what a lot of the centres doing via via the climate finance agenda or the ESG agenda is 75% of our members are public-private partnerships. So it's government and the private sector working hand in hand and say, hey, we have a challenge here. And if I just maybe look at Ireland for a moment, we commissioned Deloitte last year to do a piece of work to say, how much does Ireland actually need to decarbonise between now and 2030? And the answer was just over 50 billion euros. 
So the state is then allocating 22 billion under a national development plan. It went to the green bond market last year, took 3 billion, but the state doesn't have the first f full 50 billion. So it needs to create an ecosystem that the private sector can crowd in the capital. So what you're seeing in this agenda is a new form of public-private partnership. It's overcoming barriers to growth. It's going beyond climate. And so this is one of the things I said earlier on, what is sustainable finance? It is obviously environmental, but it's also s social and governance. Uh, so it's, just, it's, it's broader. Policy innovation is a key driver, and that's, again, what the Commission are doing. Going back to what I said about the mobile phone, a strong policy environment, one that actually encourages innovation in this space. Uh, you will see a lot happen, and that's where the Commission is right now. A diversity of financial in instruments, so it's not just banking or insurance, it's actually that entire ecosystem I went on earlier on, so insurance, banking, private sector, and academia, because if you, if you go back to uh, the, the slide I had, the 10 different uh, hubs, academia is critical in this, in terms of research and learning. Uh, I uh, sector evolution varies, so again, different centres are in different areas. Professional services are growing rapidly, so PwC helped me uh, manage this. Four or five years ago, you would have gone into one of these big firms and said, who's your sustainability person? And they would have gone, well, don't really know. Maybe him or her, because they've got a genuine interest in it and they have plants on their desk. I don't know. Now you go into these firms and they basically have 30, 40, 50 people working this place. I think EY is 800 people globally. And that's so, and, and in Dublin and other, and Paris and other centres you walk in, these people are crawling with the experts in the space because they're seeing what their clients are now saying to them. Those big corporates that Tony mentioned later on, and then the small and medium corporates are trying to figure this out. And so they're now reacting to that as well. Priorities for future, future action, uh, focus on innovation, I said that later on. So how do you merge, say, fintech and artificial intelligence with the whole sustainability climate uh, finance agenda, which is gonna be a big thing to watch. And then, as I said, international collaboration is increasing, hence the reason why I'm here uh, and ranting at you all today. So if you then look at institutional foundations, initiatives of green sustainable finance quite diverse. So I said public authorities, banks, insurance companies, there's a lot going on within those. Um, and sorry, there's an interesting one, municipal public authority are only 8%. Uh, whereas in the, in the public agency with links to municipal pro provisional national government, 8%, and then public-private are at 61%. So that's the, the way people are going. Uh, challenges, lack of green product supply. And Tony, I'll be maybe taking over later on asking you questions. But if you were to walk in off the high street now into when your bank and say, well, I want to do a green mortgage. Someone's going to look at you and go, well, we don't have a green mortgage. Or I want to finance energy efficiency. Well, I, I don't know how to do that, but we'll try and figure it out. So part of the challenge at a retail level is lack of products for you as a citizen to go in and say, well, I'd actually like to avail of that. At the commercial side, we're seeing more and more products develop, uh, which is quite interesting, but at retail, there is a challenge. Inconsistent stand standards. So again, this is why the whole taxonomy is ongoing. It's an alphabetical soup of different standards, different acronyms, and what is what. So again, there's just a challenge there. Uh, lack of market demand. So again, I was actually being quite bullish if somebody used to walk in off the street and say, give me a green uh, mortgage. That actually isn't happening either. So there is a lack of consumers coming in saying I'd like uh, to do something. Low awareness, lack of capacity. So understanding what does this actually mean. Engagement of public. Uh, mispricing of externalities, and then data quality and availability. I think the engagement of the public is a really interesting one. We've seen in the last few weeks the children go out in the streets and really cause a racket, but it was quite phenomenal to see. But why did they do it? Because they felt we as adults weren't doing enough to take this agenda on, so that's where the frustration came from. But also, if you look at Ireland again as an example, we have are now viewed as quite a progressive country from where we were a number of decades ago. Uh, a lot of things have changed in the last few years, but a lot of these changes in terms of uh, equal rights marriage and other things that have happened came about through a public assembly, which had 100 people on it, which was considered to be a representation of Ireland. And a number of things that they've actually uh, worked on have now gone into law. So there are ways and means of, of, of doing this and, and engaging the citizens. Strategic priorities, again, you know, what are, what are driving centres? Uh, if I may, capacity building is a big one. And that's, a, that's from, from, from perspective of... We're not asking financial service sectors to throw out the skill set that they have. It's actually to recognize that the skill set is the right one now when you see the layer on awareness of this agenda. I'll go through that. Enabling an environment, majority policy and regulatory measures in place are aimed at improving information flows. Uh, so a lot of what's happening at the moment through the commission, but also what Mayor Bloomberg is doing is saying to corporates, you need to disclose what you're doing. So again, I'm using Dublin because I live there as an example. During the crash in Ireland, we stopped building. 
And so in our international financial services space, which is in Dublin Docklands, if any of you've ever been there, you may or may not gone through it. But now there's cranes everywhere. And all the buildings are being built for big, large commercial entities that are primarily moving out of the UK or wherever they may be going, but uh, or where they may be coming from. But what's quite interesting is three billion euros being spent on all those new buildings. All those buildings are being built to the highest standards of energy efficiency because the people that are coming in to rent them, the JP Morgans of the world and others are saying, we demand that these buildings are the most sustainable buildings we can get because we believe in this, but we also have to report back to our investors each year we need to disclose what our carbon footprint is of our office space globally. So there's a whole push and pull going on. And Tony, I'm unsure if that's what you guys are doing as well. Enabling an environment, I'll push through that. Market environment is an important one. There's a wide range of instruments present in our member centres. So in terms of you know green finance related index or a fund in a stock exchange, uh, corporate loans. Uh, we're seeing you know a great one recently was ING. Uh, and Philips, so we all know Philips, I hope everybody knows Philips, a massive uh, Dutch conglomerate. So they went out, and I'm not sure if you guys are part of the consortium, got a loan of 1 billion euro off 60 banks and ING, the Dutch bank led on it. And what they did was they went in, and experts, they measured the carbon footprint of Philips as an entity and said, right, this is the interest rate you have now. If you decrease that carbon footprint, we'll decrease your interest rate. If it goes up, we'll increase your interest rate, and this is all signed into the contracts. So that's innovation, that's where the world is going, and that's a, a, a push and pull as well. So in terms of our, our assessment tool, and just if I may take a moment to speak about this, what's really interesting about this, and, and it's the key thing that sometimes you forget, the UN has an amazing, convenient power. I'm just shy of wearing the blue beret when I go out to all my meetings, and it's amazing that people at a very senior level sit down and you go, you are trusted, and so what we've been able to do with this assessment program is get the details and data of a lot of centers that compete and actually bring that data together. As I said, within our, uh, if I may go back to this, we're able to use this data, maybe I've gone back too far, to look at this. So now we have data around all these different points. So you're almost like a mini McKinsey. And you're able to say, well, to your members, such as Barcelona, we now have assessed where you are. We have data that you may not give out to others. And we can see it in the context of a membership and say, this is what this center did, did this is what this, this center did. And we've also got supports in place to enable you to move forward along from level zero to level five, wherever they may be within. So for me, data is king. Hence the reason why this assessment tool is quite important. And actually, if I can and be bold, Tony, I think one of the first successes of this assessment tool is Barcelona. It's why we're here, why I'm here, and why I'm here tomorrow. And it's fantastic in such a short space of time uh, for the guys who follow this and then to lead to what we have tomorrow. So as I come to a close, and just bear with me for a moment. A lot of stuff we do is at Europe. I want to just mention this because, look, Barcelona is a European city as well. Uh, as Tony said, the policy momentum is growing. Uh, we have an FC for us Europe, it's based out of Dublin, and our goal is to engage Europe's 30 financial centres to really push forward in this space. So we work with the European Commission, that's all fantastic, and the Vice President of the European Commission has, has welcomed our, our report recently. So for me, the long-term vision is, at a, at a personal level, I'm only doing this for a short while, that I have enough money in the bank to make sure that this can continue to run for three years and it is sustainable, and we build out a team to go out and help our partners such as in Barcelona to move on. At, at, a, at a global level, how can we mobilize the world's leading financial service center to put more cash into this agenda? Not from a CSR, not from philanthropic, but from a return perspective through the lens of risk and reward. And for me, the real tracker is, we're now at X billions, how can we scale up to the trillions, is what I said earlier on, and obviously, that's my final point, is make a material contribution to scaling up flows of sustainable final for finance for a world economy in transition. So that's me done. Uh, forgive me if I talk very fast. My interpreter told me earlier on today, and you can hear her, her voice in your ear, that uh, I speak fast, and that also in Spain there was one third more words. So she, this is going to be even more difficult. So uh, I want to thank Tony, I want to thank you as well, and obviously Gina and the Foundation, and I hope you found that uh, useful. But for me, it really is a thrill to be here, and I congratulate Barcelona on your leadership, and I look forward to tomorrow's event, Tony. Thank you very much. No tenemos ahora tiempo para hacer preguntas. La intervención del público es importante. Sí. Gracias. Um, thank you very much. Um, 
don't take it as a criticism. I fully agree with all your statements. So uh, I think it has been a pleasure for, for all of us hearing you. I have a picture in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Europe is like some sort of three-floor sandwich, and Europe is in the middle of US, China, and Russia. I don't know in terms of financial sustainability, if we can compare it with the position of Europe in terms of data protection, protecting privacy in China, US, and probably Russia means nothing for them. Do you think Europe can, can be in such a position in terms of financial sustainability? You have been talking about decarbonizing. We have seen the US leaving the Paris Treaty. So I'm not, I'm not I mean, should it be part of financial sustainability also to avoid fiscal paradises in Europe? Just a question. Do you think Europe has got that risk? Europe and UK, I'm still including UK there, but do you think we, we, we have that risk of, of not being powerful enough within the world in terms of gaining more people to this financial sustainability, which I think it's really key mm. for the future? Do you know, it's at these points that I realize that I work for the UN <laughs> and that uh, I'm not just an Irish person giving my opinion. So I, I suppose in answer to the, one of the questions you said about America, it was actually quite fascinating to see when President Trump announced the mobilization of cities within America, which, and some of these cities are as big as countries in terms of GDP, uh, or even states such as California, and the innovation in America in this agenda is mind-blowing from a tech perspective. But also in capital markets, and Mayor Bloom Bloomberg's leadership of, of firms that are Wall Street firms, that are brands we'd all know, is, is, is to be complimented. So at one level, Actually, it is quite interesting to see the dynamic in, in America and what's happening within the markets. And again, going back to the markets. So the markets are saying, OK, do you know what to invest in A, B, and C over here, which is the past? No, it's not going to happen anymore. We're actually we're pivoting over here. And again, as Tony said, you know, that may be driven by their consumers, their investors. But it is also looking strategically at, at the future. Where is the world going? So that's one. Two, I have no comments on data privacy or in that area. What I do have a comment on is, Forget about the rest of the world outside Europe. Europe itself, over the next decade, needs to invest or find an additional 2 trillion euro to decarbonize Europe. So forget about the rest of the world. It's where are we going to find that? And I think we will find it. I think what the Commission is doing is a fantastic effort. And I think at the member state level, such as Ireland or the UK, those efforts that are going on here. And I know Spain is coming out with a, with a new plan, as Tony said to me earlier on, which includes a whole just transition area to it as well. So within Europe, Forget about the rest of the world, two trillions required, and that needs to be from a way that's investable. The opportunity for Europe, and again, it's an opportunity, and I haven't got a crystal uh, ball, but the opportunity is in, in finding that two trillion, in mobilizing, in creating new products and services, which are investing in new technologies. If we are successful, it's in how do we export that to the, to the rest of the world? And so that gets back to the market, and uh, where's the best tech, where's the best solution? So I know I'm not answering your question, you're smiling at me, but uh, that would be my perspective. Gràcies. Parlo en català perquè tinc dificultats amb el seu idioma. Eh, M'agrada molt la seva conferència i la pregunta era quina importància li dona vostè al preu eh, del carboni, de la tonelada de CO2, eh, per poder activar totes aquesta economia. I si, és, si vostè considera que és important, quin seria el preu raonable en aquests moments o en els pròxims deu anys de carboni? Gràcies. Um, I'm not a trader, so I, I, I couldn't make a call on the, on the, on the price and then I need to be regulated by somebody. Um, I, I think from the perspective of the carbon markets, because again, uh, there's a whole debate going on in Ireland at the moment, and they're saying we need to increase it dramatically. Um, and again, it goes back to policy certainty. So, you know, okay, if you have to increase it, but w w by what, and by when, and by how? So you're, as a, as a business, you can actually factor that in. And I think some of the bigger, bigger firms, I, I look at Michelin, for example, at the moment, Michelin factors in, and I can't remember the exact price, so forgive me, but it's a lot higher. It's, it's multiples of what the current market price is. They factor into every, all their capital projects globally because they have the sense of, well, this is where the world is going. And the policymakers will eventually, it will eventually catch up. So I think at the large corporate levels, this has been factored into people's balance sheets at a higher price than what it is right now. I think politically, uh, and again, I'm going to speak to Ireland, there's a whole discussion going on, where do we need to go with this? But I don't have a, a sense of of what the price is. I know in Ireland it's, it's, I think it's over 50 euros is where they're eventually going to be higher 
So, but that's over X number of years. That's not, if something like that was to happen tomorrow, uh, it wouldn't be policy certainty, so it's over a period of time. Hi, thank you very much for your conference. Um, I wanted to ask you, why do you think institutional investors, which it just seems so obvious what you just explained, what is sort of stopping them from getting into um, not only sustainability but impact investment? Is it fiduciary duty? Is it um, measuring? Um, what is it yeah. not? So I did a piece of work last year with the UN PRI on fiduciary duty in Ireland, yeah. and it while the law was not saying that you know you're going against your fiduciary duty for not doing this, neither was it saying that actually it's a plus to do it. So a lot of these big firms are going, well, they're under stress points anyway, so it's not on the top of uh, of their list. I think the Nordics are just a fantastic example uh, of people that actually are 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 mobilising capital or investing in the way that they do, and, and that long termism approach that they actually have, uh, which they invest like you know the healthcare system, you know childcare system. It's just phenomenal when you when you step back and look at it from a planning perspective. But I think, and Tony said this earlier on, I think it's over twenty six trillion dollars right now are invested under the principles of ESG, uh, and then when you look at institutional investors and the Black Rocks are reacting to these these pension funds or the Mondays, you know they're getting more and more sophisticated around this, and and I go back and. You know, sometimes I joke about it, but you look at the new, as I said, the New York Police Department uh, cop who's been on the beat for 30 years. They retire. Where's my pension? And then somebody else comes in. So it's not a a, a quarter or one year or three year cycle. It's a it's a 60 year thing they're looking out. And so I think the institutional investors are now getting a lot more. They have a lot more data of the decades of of, of research here. So they're now able to go to their, their asset managers and say, look. We would now like to have this type of profile because our members are in this risk, as Tony said earlier on. So a lot of it is actually happening. Uh, it, a lot of it was happening behind closed doors until recently, but now we're seeing them get more and more public. Uh, and one area that we had in Ireland last year was around the whole diversity agenda. I don't know if anybody's come across Fearless Girl. Has anybody come across Fearless Girl? This is this little statue around that big on Wall Street. So um, she was put out by a, by, by a bank uh, opposite the bull one night, at the approval of the mayor only for a week, and it's a young girl looking like this at the bull, and she's saying, and it's basically, she's fearless in, in, in advance of this, and it basically has become a permanent thing now, and it's actually become a hazard because so many tourists want to get a selfie with this thing, and it's quite incredible, there's three of them, uh, one is in Copenhagen permanently, one is in New York, and one goes around the world, and it's in, in London for a few months now. We were fortunate to have it, when Tony was in Dublin last year, in Dublin, uh, for a few days, and grown adults just went crazy over this thing, it was fantastic. Uh, trying to get selfies, and I think Tony got a selfie as well. But <laughs> what, what was interesting about it was just the whole thing behind it was diversity, female empowerment. And I think, you know, some may say a bit of a PR exercise, but it allowed the company that went with it to go to all the companies that got a stake in it saying, why don't you have more females on the board? All research points that this will be a better run company with a balance. And now it's not just at the board level now, it's now going through the executives. So. I'm seeing a lot more, and it goes back to that point. Three years ago, there was X policy papers. Now there's 270 more. So it's just accelerating all the time, and where will be in the next three years? So I think, in answer to your question, I'm seeing a lot more happening, which is great. There's a lot more data. There's a lot more products coming to people to measure. Uh, but we've still got a good way to go. And what the commission is now doing is trying to put ESG at the heart of everything that they're pushing out of DG FISMA, and if that was to happen, that would really push the market on in a major way. Impact investing, though, if I may for one sec, sometimes I think people look at that almost like philanthropy. And they, I've made a few books, so I'll put it into a fund, and we call it impact investing. It's, it's so much more than that. And the firms like, you're now seeing Goldman Sachs and others are setting up funds but in the billions. And so the return isn't as high, but I want to have an impact as an individual. So that's something that we know in Ireland, there's a lot of funds domiciled in the impact space. And again, it's getting bigger and bigger. And so it's not so much, I want the return, but it doesn't have to be as high as the normal. Uh, but I do want my money back, but I want to make sure I'm having an impact as well. And you think there's a risk of greenwashing a little bit now, because you see many companies now sort of saying, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing ESG here, or ESG there, but some of the measurements that they use are not really that relevant. Yeah. So you know, the criteria that you can do for your ESG measurement, et cetera. Yeah. So know. we did a survey last year, and it was the first state of play in, in ESG in Ireland, and we were delighted that X number of asset managers responded to it. And 81% of them had an ESG policy in place. And I was delighted with that, but the, the question back to me was, well, how deep are those policies? And actually, having gone through them all, they're, they're all quite deep. 
but they've taken time to get there. They've invested a lot of money to make sure they've got robust policies in place. Because at the end of the day, the, the investors that are going out to the institutional people are the Nordics, are those companies that can see this through this very, very quickly. So I know from an Irish context, a lot of, a lot of investment's gone in there. But as you rightly point out, this is a hot area, right? There's going to be people going, hey, guess what? I'm going to save the world with this. Invest in it. And some people are going to go, oh, okay, I, I, I can do that. And we've seen that in other sectors. There was tech. I remember when I had technology for development, technology was going to save Africa. It was going to save the poor countries. Let's give everybody a computer. Okay? And that was never the case. And technology is an enabler of development. So, again, capital markets are an enabler of commerce. And I think what will happen is, as you said, there are things happening. They, these things do happen. But the market will then push those things aside. <clears throat> I, I would add in that point that greenwashing, which is uh, obviously, obviously it is a, a threat that we may have. Uh, last, last week in a, in a, in a conference, uh, we had the opportunity to share also with other banks and, and regulators. And, and in general, in the financial market, we haven't had this topic, uh, although there is a risk there. But uh, I would say that in general, the, the market has been quite disciplined. And um, we have defined standards even before the regulation, and now comes the regulation using those standards to regulate as a, ba as a baseline. No? This is an example of the green bond principles, the social bond principles, which is a standard that was created by the industry that has been quite clear, which is other procedures you have to follow for issue a green bond, a social bond, and it has worked. And, and now the European Commission is taking these standards, no, as as a baseline to 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 develop a U U level in green bonds or social bonds. So, and and now also we have the green loans principles or the new ones that were announced two weeks ago, the sustainability link loan principles, and a standard to 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 manage uh, what um, you said, no, uh, that operation, that deal mm -hmm. on ING, or also yes. that the, the kind of deals that we have, uh, where you can set you can set the the, uh, the the price of the of the loan to specific KPI, ESG performance or carbon performance or whatever. No, so I would say that uh, the market has developed quite quick, mm, quite robust standards, and that has helped to avoid. Uh, this uh, risk of greenwashing. Now I would say the challenge that we have is we need a massive scale of change yep. and uh, we cannot get it if we only focus on big corporations providing green loans, very nice green loans certified by a third party. We need to mobilize SMEs on renewable energy. We need to mobilize households. Uh, we need to mobilize retail investors. And to do that, well, uh, we need uh, more actions, no? Thanks to the European Commission that is no, providing a very yep. aggressive Robust. action plan, no? Yep. Question? So let me, let, me, let me ask you a couple of things that's not really questions. Well, okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> not, not really question, but maybe just to, to give you the opportunity to elaborate a little bit more on some topics. So one, one is the relationship. So you mentioned the role of Africa yeah. and, and Europe, Africa, and China. I think that's, that's a triangle that it's, that it's important because, because China is the big player right now in, in Africa in, in terms of investment, mm -hmm. right? So uh, no, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. And, and the, other, the other question is, so if there are two words or two topics I getting from all these uh, events, of a series of conferences we've had is, so one, it's, it's the idea of the need of regulation. So it seems that everybody's talking about regulation. So the regulation for, you know, it seems that a solution from the point of view of the more, of the academics and, and the need of regulation that uh, actually the private companies are also asking for, for, mm -hmm. for regulation and coordination, yeah. right? So how easy it is to, to coordinate all that regulation at, 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 at the world level? Or is it necessary? So is, is there any role? Hmm? Or what are the, the problems we have on, on yep. this issue? I, I, well, I think if I, if I start with the regulation point, but, uh, and I think it just builds on what Tony just said, we, we dramatically need to accelerate the scaling of capital. And so, you know, when I was in government, people used to give out to me about tendering processes. There's a reason why there's a tender process. It protects both sides, right? And it, it creates a level playing field. 
it's meant to create certainty and transparency. So in terms of regulation, what the Commission is trying to do now is say, hey, we need to accelerate the, just dramatically in terms of cash into the market. So as Tony said, we're going to work with the private sector, which is what's going on right now in, in Brussels, to create this policy framework that allows the private sector to react and create products and services which actually lead to the scaling of that. But again, going back to what Tony said, it can't just be large corporates, it has to be at the SME level as well, where you really see change. That's one about the regulation. The coordination, uh, obviously the G7, G20 have all done a lot. There's a network, as Tony said, for green and financial system, which the Spanish Central Bank is on. We're an observer as part of that. There's our network. The, but the European Commission just announced they're creating a new intergovernmental network of ministers in this area. So we're going to be working with them on that as well. So again, that's going back to one of the questions earlier on, that's coordination at an international level. And a, a few weeks ago in Brussels at the event that both Tony and I attended, you had the, Ch you had the uh, Indian Minister for Finance and you had the CEO of the Japanese Government Pension Fund, which is the largest pension fund in the world, the 1.52 both in the room. So there's a lot of coordination going on there at that level in, in Europe. In terms of Africa, Europe and China, look, isn't it just amazing the innovation that comes out of Africa? It's just amazing. So my background is technology, and I'm walking around Europe or wherever it may be going, wow, I can walk somewhere and just tap this, and I can pay, and I'm amazed, and this all came out of the West. It didn't. It came out of Africa. And what you see, Citibank across my office in Dublin, they have a research centre where they're taking stuff that's been created in Africa and redeveloping it for use in Western markets. But the innovation came from Africa. And they're not developing, you know, I, I don't know what's called here, but your energy system in Ireland is ESP. They're not dropping tens of billions into a brand new energy network. They're doing microgrids. And the same in telecoms and, you know, paying over the telephone and all these different things that are happening. So the innovation that's coming out in terms of energy and water and other things in Africa is phenomenal. What they actually need now is capital to scale it up. So from my perspective of Europe and China, uh, yes, China is a big player. Yes, Europe is a big player. Uh, from my perspective is how can actually Europe and China work together to build capacity of the policy makers and the regulators and everybody else in these marketplaces to make sure that African-led uh, frameworks for policy and regulation that actually make it attractive for private capital to crowd in to support innovation and then meet the scale for the solutions. That's what I'd be looking at. Okay. I, have a, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> I'm having dinner with you later. No, so you no, 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 no. <laughs> Imagine that we have, and you have in one table, the local government of a city like, let's say, Barcelona, and uh, also financial institutions, investors, uh, banks, and also, why not, uh, uh, business leaders from different industries, representatives from uh, SMEs associations, and they work all together and they ask you, well, we want to mobilize more uh, capital, which which would be the, the priorities do you think that uh, they should focus? Which would be your recommendations for to um, to make a relevant step, no, on the on this transition that uh, has to be done at the at the larger scale, no? Do you have any uh, using the experience from other centers of what was happening, working or not? Yep. What could be the hey guys, focus on this, on that, and uh, I will come next year. We'll see. No? Yeah, I'll come back to Barcelona in yeah. between, but because uh, <laughs> it's beautiful. But uh, no, I, I get I get your point. And it was actually one of your colleagues, uh, one of Gina's colleagues, asked me earlier on. She interviewed me. She made me feel like a superstar, it was fantastic, but uh, I have no editing power over the video, so I don't know how I'm going to come across. But she did say to me, she goes, if, if you come into a city and you say, well, what should the city be doing in from a climate environmental in terms of impact? And for me, it's either transport or water, right? And so I'm coming at your question slightly differently because we know there isn't a shortage of capital. There's loads of capital out there. There's a shortage of projects that have been developed in a way that somebody says, well, actually, we've got a target out to 2030 to 2050. We want to, so again, I'm gonna go, from, I'm gonna move away from Barcelona. I'm gonna to go to Dublin, because then I'm on safe ground per se. So we know that over 50% of water leaks out of the, uh, the pipes in Dublin, in the water pipes each day, okay? Which is just ridiculous. We now know we're having to go outside Dublin to start piping it in. And a lot of that infrastructure, believe it or not, was built in the Victorian era. Okay, so if you actually know that we have a challenge around water, which the government does, we've got a prime minister who is in his late 30s saying, actually, I want to really take on this climate agenda. We've got private sector with solutions, there's loads of capital, but what's the plan? 
And I think that's the key thing is that it's it's not so much the capital guy saying, I can give you that cash or, or come up with a plan. It's the engineers, it's the technocrats saying, if our, if we say we want to half the loss of that water by 2030 and it's going to have this impact, or we want to have a very strong uh, transport, they will go off and develop that plan in through the lens of climate. And that's when they then actually sit down with the, well, actually, sorry, they don't then sit down with the finance guys. The finance guys have been working them all along to make sure the sense checking it. So it's more so, if I can, Tony, switch it from capital leading to being capital being the enabler of sustainable economic development. And for me, if I was sitting as a city in Dublin, I'm saying it's water or transport. I don't know what it is in Barcelona, uh, but a lot of city, similar cities are similar. And then actually coming up with our target, how much is it going to cost? It has to be a mixture of public and private capital. And how is a private capital going to get a return? And that goes back to policy certainty. So I'm, I'm not trying to fudge that. I've just come from it at a different way. Yes. Uh, hello. Um, I am. Uh, I would define myself as a serial re-entrepreneur, <laughs> uh, successful uh, here in Barcelona. I come from Argentina. Uh, um, I've been doing this for a few years successfully, and the. I see a lot of opportunities uh, to do a lot of business, concrete business, uh, in recycling spaces, recycling companies. Uh, we bought uh, a company, a 183 years old company, that recycles paper. Uh, we recycled the city <laughs> which belong there. We recycled the company. Uh, we've been bought from this bank, uh, Adept. Uh, we see uh, that um, a very good opportunity, but there's like a distance between the policy makers, the big guys, the corporations they talk about, uh, and the concrete uh, opportunities in the market. Uh, how can uh, how can you s how can uh, maybe smaller players get in in in, in contact uh, with the real opportunities? Uh, um, I see Europe as, as a, a land of, they, they throw away everything, uh, water, resources, spaces, uh, and there's a lot of abundance. Uh, if you see all this abundance uh, that can be recycled, re rethink of it, re re uh, th there's good <laughs> money <laughs> to give to the uh, people that uh, want to invest, and 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 doing that, uh, uh, you can you can make even more money. That makes more money. The, uh, but but there's uh, like you know the, there's the big <laughs> issues, and 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 there's the real people that want to get involved and and have opportunities uh, to do that. How can how can we match those two? Yeah. I, I think, again, it goes back to Tony's point, is the real engine of change is going to be the SMEs. You know, that's the majority of companies in any country in, in Europe. So, Tony, maybe yeah. you might not that? No, I, I, I agree that um, that there is a, some misconnection between the, what is happening already, is a reality today on the certain level of companies and corporations, that uh, they have also pressure from investors and from their clients, sometimes public authorities, public client no? uh, asking for better performance on sustainability topics and then go to a bank to provide or to investors to provide funding in a different way but at the, at the, at the SME level that's true that it is not today yet um, let's say good uh, solutions at the financial level no? uh, I would say that in general SMEs consider sustainability as a, as a cost not as a, an opportunity and, uh, uh, with the exception of those SMEs that are focused on circular economy or specific core green activities, no? Uh, well, there is, an, I, I think that well, it was, uh, I think, well, I, in fact, the last time that it was in Dublin in November, I had the privilege to attend to, to the Climate Kick uh, Summit, uh, Innovation Summit, where, where Climate Kick is the, one of the most important uh, partnerships in Europe, no? Promoting innovation and connecting uh, 
climate entrepreneurs with uh, new ways of funding and investment and uh, so that this is a good example of how European Commission is trying to promote different uh, ways to, 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 to accelerate this transition also at that level. No? So that's a, that's a good, uh, good example because there were a very good uh, uh, initiative and uh, they are also now starting to work also here in Spain no? to promote, uh, well, different uh, activities, uh, uh, climate hackathons, so, uh, different activities to connect the, the ecosystem no? also on the green space. No? So I think that that's the, that's the role. In general, the banks, uh, we we are not dead yet. I mean, there is uh, only a few investment impact investment funds focused on these and participating banks, and we are focused on corporate clients. It's true that we have to move quick, also on the SMEs level, and engage more with our clients, no, uh, with our customers. Uh, that's that's something that uh, I think it's an opportunity for for banks in general, not only in Spain. I would say in general in the world, because you know, even the, the the most advanced banks. They are not there yet. Uh, I think that's, how th that's the reason why we think that uh, it's good to be here to to learn and see how we can develop better solutions. So good. Hello, <coughs> thank you very much for your for your very motivational uh, talk. Um, I work in the tourism industry as a sustainable tourism uh, label implementation here in Barcelona for the city hall of Barcelona and the for Diputación. And I was wondering if in the financial sector that it's so sensitive, is there any label mm -hmm. that um, certifies the management of this, of any small or large corporation? Well, uh, yeah. Go, yeah. The, the European Commission is, uh, as Stephen said, is doing an Im impressive job uh, on, on trying to mobilize uh, uh, sustainable finance, uh, also to help the financial system to manage better the risk, but promoting also sustainable finance as an opportunity. And this uh, action plan was launched uh, one year ago by the European Commission in, uh, under the leadership of uh, Vice President Dombrovskis. Uh, he was absolutely a visionary on this, and, uh, and there is uh, 10 actions that are being implemented uh, now and very quick. Um, and in, we have the roadmap clear for, for the next two years and one of the main first uh, action measures is uh, the, to define a, a taxonomy a catalog to define what is sustainable, what is not sustainable. It will take practically two years to develop. By the way, China developing for only four months. Uh, but in Europe, we will need two years at the end to, to develop this taxonomy. But uh, yes, the, I would say the regulator, in this case, the European Commission is trying to uh, establish first taxonomy, then establish specific uh, eco levels and funds and uh, standards. I would say that, uh, yes, it will arrive, not now, but uh, the way where we could have uh, certified activities. But in any case, if you are a big company, you can have a, a, a second opinion by uh, any specialist analyst on ESG that can certify that you have activities on one field or another. No? So I think this is if you are a big company, you already have. The problem is the medium company or the SMEs, they, they don't have, uh, it's not so easy to have a certified or branded activities, no? At the end, banks will have the, will have the request to report to the ECB, which is our exposure on green lending and on brown lending. So we'll have to know in our balance sheet which activities we are finding uh, and that are can, can be considered green or not. Because maybe in the medium term, uh, ECB going to request a specific different capital requirements for one type of assets in front of other type of assets, no? And that's the way probably that uh, will change. So it will come, it will come a certain way to, to, to standardize the, the, which activity can be considered green or not. Hi, so, <coughs> sorry, so as a, so to, to private investors, one thing that comes to my mind when it comes to investing in, in sustainable finances are crowd lending platforms that invest in green projects. Do you know how developed these things are and how well regulated are? Because the fintech, the fintech um, environment is still uh, lagging a bit in terms of regulation. Yeah. Again, I can only speak to Dublin. Uh, I believe you know, it's all about regulation brings certainty, yeah? And that with that regulation then allows you to grow, why would you invest in a company that's going to manage hundreds of millions that isn't regulated? So um, 
you know, there's a lot happening. It's, it's quite interesting, actually, just building on what Tony just said. If you go back to the commission where it all comes out, the DG FISMA, the person who's over sustainable finance, is now also over fintech. And I just find that a really interesting that Europe is now saying, actually, how do we bring these two together? Uh, you know, you hear things about artificial intelligence. I just, in, in when I hear AI, I'm thinking like nightmare stuff, right? But it is incredible that AI can be used now around ESG, and measurement, validation, fintech around crowding in funding. You see tech firms now getting banking licenses. And it's just quite incredible, as, as Tony said, your fifth, when your fifth driver was technology disruption. I think what a real kicker for me, though, is, and this is one of the things that I'm looking at and I've been looking at for a while, the crowding, the, the funds, those platforms are, fa are fantastic. But we're going to really need the banks themselves to get on top of this agenda because it is about scale again. So we would have done the climate kick stuff around startups, and it was fantastic at the conference last year. But one of the things that was missing from the conference last year, with the exception of Tony and a few others, were actually the investors, the big bankers, because it was a lot of the, the, the startups. And uh, somebody said to me before, similar position of Tony of seniority, said, I went to one of these sessions and I spoke. And for 11 months afterwards, I got these emails of people I met asking me, can I give them cash? And they just thought that's the way the world, you know. And he was like, I'm, I'm actually investing in companies directly. And, and so what you have is what I'm now looking at as intrapreneurship. So one of the things that I want to see FC Fresh, we're now working with the Commission on Sustainable Finance and FinTech saying, you want to scale up all this money? You're going to need the big banks, the insurance firms to look internally and say, why do we keep going out to all these consultants and paying a lot of money to say, what innovation do you think we should do when they're going to just listen to us, put it in a PowerPoint, which is going to have traffic-like system and say, this is what you should do as a green, red, or, and then you can cover your backside because, well, they told me to do it. So I think what we're now looking at is, is going and work with the big institutions and saying, but what ING did, which is fantastic, what BNP Paribas are doing, Tony and the guys are doing, where does that innovation come from internally? And can you create a structure to really nurture that, create it? And so somebody in the big institution isn't going, oh God, if I do this, I won't have a promotion over here because they're saying I'm, it's about product development. So for me, it's, it's bringing together that FinTech startup with the big institutions. And that's something that FC Fresh is really really focus on because while it's amazing and I'm not dismissing this I'm actually celebrating it Crowd Platform A has got an X hundred million away that's fantastic it's brilliant I wish I was brave enough to try and do something that but we actually need trillions and the only way we get to trillions is we actually begin to and not have the big guys buy them but a partnership does that make sense? I get quite exercised about it and hopefully I'll make money someday as well is that okay? yeah so I think it's time to thank uh, thank Tony for being here. Thank the for the for the uh, for the room uh, for this event, yep. and especially thank Stephen thank Nolan you. for mm, for this great talk and answering all the questions and, and the good humor. And thanks everybody <laughs> for for listening to me. And forgive me for not having Spanish. It's embarrassing. It's amazing to hear everybody speak in English so well. So I do apologize, and uh, I won't have it next time I come back. I'm not going to make any promises, but thank you very much and. As I said here, it's amazing that Barcelona tomorrow yeah. yep. is launching its sustainable finance initiative. So, Good. best, uh, best Thank of you Barcelona. Very much. Thank you.